thank you very much to attend this webinar series of Time Pack Academy. Uh, well, this is the second one that we are doing, and we are very happy to to explain and and for this webinar because we will be able to to expose and to to explain the the advanced the the, the different methods that we have now and tools for uh, the renovation buildings. And as a Time Pack Academy, uh, the Time Pack project, as most of you know, because most of you I attended the last meeting, is is an European research project and you can see and you can uh, read all the information that you want in the timepack.eu uh, uh, website. And in this case, the Timepack Academy today, uh, we are happy to to expose the, the presentation for uh, the this one is the, the title of the webinar is Advanced Methods on Tools for Holistic Energy Renovation of Buildings. And what we are going to do is to explain the different chances that we have, the different uh, BIM, the BIM, the information modeling uh, uh, point of view, uh, the technology BIM, the, the BIM technology, how we can manage and how we can improve and enhance the different parts that you need in a renovation for retrofitting. In this case, we will be, uh, we will see the new, and I think it's very, very interesting, the, the new energy performance of building directive. In this case, from uh, uh, Eric Potochar uh, will be in charge of that. And, and he is a, a, a person we will see afterwards. And this is just to have the big picture of what is new in Europe for energy performance on building directives. And in the second uh, presentation, uh, in this case, it's, it will be me, myself, and uh, I will explain the different parts, the advantage of creating a big model and why a big model is important for a build renovation. What is the value of a big model for renovation point of view in order to create not just the energy performance certificate or the simulation, more things and how, is, uh, how we can do it. And afterwards, we will see how to use the, the 3D model. In this case, will be Alice Gorino from Edel Klima. And uh, the 3D models and the EPC in order to analyze energy savings, uh, Alice will be able to, she will explain the connection between 3D models, B models to uh, energy uh, simulation tools and how to create the different savings, the different measures or improvements. And I think it is very, it will be very interesting as well. And the fourth one will be uh, how to generate enhanced EPCs with BIM data. In this case, will be uh, Alvaro, uh, uh, will be in charge from the La Salle, uh, and we will uh, see afterwards. And in this case, we will see a most important or one of the most important uh, words that we have we are doing in time pack project and the different guides and in, in this case alvaro we will explain the guides that we have developed for uh, because of the project and they will they are uh, open for for you and you will see how it works and the last one and not less important is uh, how to create this building renovation passport the 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 next steps that we need, and in this case, Susan, uh, Susan Hazler, sorry, Susan for my pronunciation of your sign name, but Susan will be in charge of uh, explaining how we can do and what is the next step that we have, uh, focusing on data and the different tools that we have for that. And at the end, we will uh, we will close the presentation, and of course, uh, this now we have five presentation for this uh, webinar. We have time and more or less every presentation will be around 20 minutes, maybe less. And please, if you have questions, you can write in the chat of, uh, and we will, I will try to, to select uh, some questions in order to ask the, the speaker the, the question that you have. Okay, and if uh, this is the first part and let's get started. And with the, this is me, that's the welcome part. And this is, uh, and this is Benjamin Gonzalez from SIPE <coughs> Software. 
And well, uh, this is the, the first part and let's get started. To start, uh, we have Eric Potocar. Eric Potocar is uh, a, a member of the Ministry of Slovenia, the Ministry of the Environment, Climate and Energy of Slovenia. And today he's a guy who he's a person who has to travel around Europe in different meetings and have a lot of knowledge for the new energy performance, the new directive that we have, the energy performance of building directive. And in this case, uh, he's going to explain the challenges that we have for the new one. And in this case, I'm going to. Uh, now, Eric, you can share your screen and the floor is yours. OK, thank you. You're welcome. The screen is possible to see. Now is, but it's not the full screen. What are you? Uh, just a moment. OK, now it is probably it's OK. Yeah, yeah. OK, thank you. Uh, yes, I'm coming from Slovenia, from the Ministry of Environment, Climate and Energy, and I will try to show you shortly the review of the EPBD. Uh, what's the new, what's with new the revision? Uh, it's really a lot of topics, so I will just go through that, maybe focusing on some mm, topics a little more. So. Uh, EPBD, EPBD is a part of really of this climate goal and that means that it's really important stakeholder and to achieving them. So uh, the EPBD will support uh, to decarbonize these buildings across the whole European Union and that means that uh, we, we will have better performing buildings with lower energy bills and, uh, and of course we will cut the emissions. So uh, essential is that we need to increase the annual renovation rate uh, and that we will get more highly efficient and fully decarbonized building stock by 2050. If we look today, we have only 1% of the building can undergo energy efficiency renovation every year. And most of the buildings, more than 75%, we can say that it's not energy efficiency uh, efficient today. And still, most of the buildings will still be here uh, in 2050. That means that uh, we need to really improve uh, the depth and the rate of the renovation. And this is really essential that we will meet the EU climate goals. And this is the center of the EPBD, as we are talking about. Uh, yeah, uh, when we look directive, uh, we can split it or divide it into four areas, for example, for in the, in the renovation area, financing area, decarbonization, modernization and the system integration. Uh, it's really a, a lot of different topics inside, maybe for beginning just to, to tell you, really not, with new directive we will have the new improved energy performance certificates, which will be based on the common EU template with the common criteria. Uh, we will, with new this EPBD, we will have the measures to improve both the strategic planning of the renovation and the tools to ensure that such renovation will happen. Uh, member states will need to have not, not anymore the long-term strategy, but will need to have to establish national building renovation plans uh, for all the national strategies which they have. Uh, EPBD will also help to the EU to phase out boilers powered by the fossil fuels. That means the subsidies, for example, for installation of the boilers powered by fossil fuels will not be allowed from the 1st of the January 2025. Uh, also, EPBD will boost uh, sustainable mobility with pre-cabling for buildings, recharging points for electric vehicles, and of course, uh, and of course, bicycles parking spaces. So there are really a lot of topics, uh, and, but now I will try to focus uh, with the topics which are more related to the time pack project. So, uh, and EPBD also refers to different levels and stakeholders. Um, maybe I will start my sentence with that. We will not be able to have advanced smart cities without smart digitalization. And that means that we need upgrade of the EPBD and of course, the time period project, as I mentioned, is really part of that and really helped to realize that. 
So uh, the basic goal to decarbonize the building stock by 2050, uh, for beginning, uh, it's really important, as we already have in the previous EPB, this uh, minimum energy efficiency standards. That means that uh, this is important to have it. Uh, and uh, here is a step with new revised EPBD further. That means that um, with EPBD says that member states with minimum energy efficiency standards uh, will need to send to, to will need to set a maximum energy efficiency threshold for non-residential buildings uh, that by 2030 16 percent and by 2033 26 percent of the national building stock will exceed this threshold. Of course, this this could be different. EPBD has options, could be different for different types and categories for non-residential uh, buildings. This will be really a new challenge. This came really at last days in December in the in directive. So it's new thing and it's uh, something really step uh, step ahead. So uh, when we are talking about residential buildings, there will be that uh, by 2030, we will need to reduce at least 16% compared to 2020 and by 2035 to reduce at least 20 to 22% compared to 2022 uh, buildings. Uh, maybe can just add that uh, member states will ensure that at least 55% of the reduction in average primary primary energy consumption, it will also be achieved through the renovation of the worst energy efficient residential buildings, not to forget on them. So minimum energy efficiency standards is really important thing with new directive and uh, we will need to look, uh, we will be some sort of bigger challenge. Zero emission buildings. Um, yes, we got the new definition. You have it right on the slide. Uh, the directive imposes an obligation on all member states to ensure that new buildings uh, will be a zero emission buildings from the yes. first gen. From the Eric, first gen. Yes. Eric, what, what second? Can you move your camera? What second? Because we can see you the full uh, your your face. We can see it's part of your face. That's only if you can move. Yes, I can. Now we can see before better. Thank you. Uh, okay, okay. Or, or a little more because we, we can see it's maybe more. You can do it. Uh -huh. Is this yes. better? Yes, now it's better. Okay, Thank you. Okay, Thank you. sorry. Um, yes, uh, zero emission building. It's really important one uh, because uh, really offers when we look economically and technically from the economically technically feasible uh, this capacity to respond to external signals um, uh, what's interesting with this zero emission buildings that there will be need to that that emission building is at least 10 percent lower than the threshold of the total primary energy consumption. Now we have it for the nearly zero energy buildings. And um, really zero emission buildings means that all that energy which we use, that is we, all that annually primary energy we will use, it will come from the, uh, it will be, it, need, it will need to be covered from, from the renewable energy from the on the side, from from renewables made from some sort of communities, maybe if there is possibility from some sort of the efficient district heating or from other sort of energy which is carbon free. So uh, maybe it's interesting that uh, I can add that uh, when we're looking from the energy certificate persp perspective, the letter A plus uh, will represent zero emission buildings. So, um, um, Zero emission building is new thing. We will talk about it. And uh, from for, for for beginning, when we are talking, for example, from deep renovation, that means that before 2030, when we are talking about deep renovation, we are talking about renovation into nearly zero energy buildings. And after 2030, we will talking when we are talking, we will talk about deep renovation. We will talk about uh, zero emission buildings. Life cycle global warming potential. Uh, also, some sort of new things which are coming inside. It's important. Uh, it's really showing us what's the 
entire life cycle. Uh, in, it really indicates the total contribution that's building contribute to the emissions that cause the climate change. Uh, and here inside we have the combination of all the greenhouse gas emissions, which is embedded in the construction uh, production, uh, directly in and indirectly emissions from the use. So um, uh, th this is one of the first steps how to go further uh, to look the building from the life cycle and the circular economy of the whole building. So uh, what, 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 what I can mention here that it will be obligated that in the energy performance certificate from the 1st January 2028, it will be for the bigger big buildings, bigger than 1000 square meters, it will be obligatory for uh, new buildings uh and uh, after 2030 for all new buildings uh, the next thing is interesting maybe it's not so connected today i just have one slide uh, just to mention that uh, member states will need to ensure that all new buildings uh, should be in the future designed uh, in the way that they can optimize the solar energy production potential uh, based on the solar irradiance of the site, uh, allowing that also later you can boost cost effective installation of solar energy technology on the, such a building. So uh, member states will need to ensure that the installation of the solar energy production devices, uh, of course, if they are technically suitable and economical and finance uh, functionally feasible from the end of the 2026 on all new public buildings, new buildings owned by the public authorities. Uh, which are bigger than 20, 250 square meters, we'll need to have this uh, solar uh, installation. And that means that also late, then you have regulation also for the existing buildings, what it's for the public authorities uh, with usable floor through differently through the year. And uh, of course, uh, um, from, from with beginning of 2030, that means also for all new residential buildings, not just for the public buildings and for new covered parking lots. That means that solar energy of buildings will really come on every building, on every new building. It's really step ahead with the solar energy. But of course, there will be possible exceptions, as I mentioned, from technical and, and economical view. Renovation passport, if we go a little closer to look at the building, uh, it's really important. Today we will also people talk a little more about that. Um, the, the, aim, the aim is to provide better and more tailored information about the renovation of the building. Uh, after two years of the adoption of the directive, uh, member states will, introduce their will need to introduce the renovation passport scheme. Uh, it should be voluntary by the owners, but also the member states uh, will have possibility to make it mandatory. Uh, there is also some directive also has a lot of different possibilities. Also, for example, that can be issued uh, together with energy certificates. So this renovation passport can really uh, accelerate deep renovation. Uh, it will be personalized to the building owners, uh, to the building directly to one building, specific building to the building owners. And uh, it, it, it's really the, I, I would like to point it out that the purpose of such a passport is really to identify um, the measures which will help to decarbonize your building before 2050. Uh, at the latest, of course. Uh, directive also says that, of course, it needs to be issued by qualified experts, uh, that there is possibility that member states can establish a specific digital tool to help uh, with this uh, program, how to have very efficient this renovation passport system. So there is a lot of things. In detail, people later on today will also talk about that. Uh, maybe I can just mention what the directive says it should be included in this uh, in this passport. That means all information what is currently uh, energy, what, what is current energy efficiency of the buildings, 
um, graphic like present pre presentation uh, with the steps uh, how you can make presentation what's today uh, the current minimum energy efficiency requirements for the buildings uh, percentage of the energy consumption which is possible when you will renovate such a building and of course all the other information related to the financial resources and concretely with directly contact and the links for example, one-stop shop website and all the consultancy services when you can get a little more information. Smart readiness indicator. Uh, it's really indicator which will really help us to contribute to energy savings. Uh, colleagues already in this uh, already talked about and mentioned smart readiness indicator also in the previous lectures. Um, I just would like to point out that it really measures the capacity of buildings to use the information and communication in technologies and electronic systems to adapt to the operation of the buildings, to the needs of residents and the network, and to improve the energy and overall efficiency of the buildings. I would just to point out here that uh, in the middle of the 2027, the European Commission will adopt an act. Uh, will which will also require the use of the common scheme of the classified buildings uh, according to the readiness for the system a smart system for non-residential building for again uh, for non-residential buildings and there will be the limit with the effective nominal output when you look at the heating system conditioning system uh, everything together that it's above 290 kilowatt so smart readiness indicator uh will will also possible to issue with other uh, with other uh, assessments like epcs and or or with other existing schemes as we have today in St. countries inspections of the technical systems um, uh, this common common european union scheme at first will define the definition of the indicator of readiness and later on on, on the methodology how it uh, should be all the functionalities of the buildings and the building systems uh, this is shortly i just pointed out the the most important things of directive uh, to put uh, what, what is inside directives is not yet published in official journal of european commission it will be in before the summer this year and after that the countries we will will have member states will have two years to implement uh, into national regulation with this i will stop and i'm open with the for the other questions thank you thank you eric on time and it's time for questions you have I'm very interesting. Thank you because it's very interesting. The changes that are coming are coming on I run now, actually, most of them. And now it's time if you have questions, we can please. Or maybe it's everything clear and we have no question, maybe Eric, because you have explained it very well. Well, if if there is i have actually a question it's it's just because okay uh, we have a is a question that we have is in in the next performance calculation methods the, the dynamic method and eric no worries about it will be inserted the sri the smart greenness indicator and the b and the bacs the bugs this is a question if there will be insight because they explain here uh, Pascal that if if not uh, it's difficult to valorize the tools what is your idea about the smart readiness indicator and the BACS regarding the, the energy performance calculation methods Oof, <laughs> very difficult to question yeah I, yeah I, I think I think but, uh, uh, I, I will just say it's difficult to say what, what, what will be in, at the end, but uh, I, I think this is important. I think that we are going in that direction that uh, this dynamic methodology will get more and more important. I think that uh, 
uh, maybe I could, I will just say shortly, m more efficient we have the buildings, more we are talking about the lower energy consumptions, more, more detailed uh, method methodology we need, and that means that uh, dynamic methodology in such a all the instruments are getting more and more important. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Eric. Uh, if there is not, we are perfectly on time. So if there is no questions, afterwards, if you send more questions, maybe at, at the end uh, we can answer more questions. But well, now is thank you very much. Now is actually is my time because I have to. I'm going to wait a second. I'm going to talk here and here. This is just to say that. The next presentation that I'm going to do is just to, to be is actually today I have two roles. The first role is to moderate and the second one is to press uh, to present this. This is the, the what we are going to present is this is my presentation and let me put here is the advantage of uh, wait a second. The advantage. Let me see. OK, perfect. Now it's time to uh, for the next presentation is advantage of creating a model uh, a big model for building renovation, and in this case, uh, why we are we are here is the this is uh, because uh, we think that it's very important the the why uh, always is why if if it is productive from point of view productive and is useful the value of the big model for building renovation. When we are talking about new buildings, I think it's easier because it's clear that this is useful because uh, uh, during the construction stage, you will save a lot of uh, problems and you will save money as well. And But for building renovation, maybe it's not so clear if uh, it's worth it, if it's worth the, the B model, the creation of the B model for that. And for this reason, uh, today and in this presentation, I'm going to explain uh, the different parts and what for uh, the reason why uh, the BIM model is is useful is useful for building renovation uh, in from the design stage and the construction stage as well. The first one will be I'm going to to talk about collaboration and coordination. This is one of the parts for a, a renovation. A building renovation is important because many uh, stakeholders participate and in in a build renovation the second part is the accuracy and the quality if this is very exact if this is very precise the different parts and how we can do this the accuracy and quality uh, uh, methodology the third part that i'm going to talk is the sustainability it's when we are going with when we are when we create a a, a big model we have a lot of parts that this is important to 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 take into account this part, okay? And uh, the the bill of quantities is the second one. The budget management, the the improvements that we are going to because of renovation, always we need to take into account the different options and the different measures and the different uh, improvements that we can do in the building. And this is the relation probably with the building digital logbook and. A more thing, and the, the final part uh, is why the BIM model and the future of the BIM model for the building. And one of the things is maybe the digital twin, and I'm going to talk uh, just a few, a couple of slides of the digital twin, and why we think that this is important for the, the BIM model and for the renovation for the uh, stage. Well, uh, the first one, the collaboration and coordination. If we take into account, we have a lot of stakeholders from uh, when we are doing a deep renovation, actually if it's a renovation or a deep renovation as well, we are participating architects, MEP engineers, uh, structure engineers, civil engineers, uh, quantity surveyors, uh, coordinators, and with different specialties. And this is the reason why we need to, to take into account that uh, we need to, to, to coordinate and, and the collaboration uh, of all the uh, uh, projects that we have, because it's not only we project different uh, calculations, it's different, uh, uh, it's many um, uh, 
inputs for every specialist. And in this case, we will see that this is possible to collaborate all together. And the workflow, this is a workflow that uh, the, the first one is when we are doing this renovation, uh, why the B model is important is because we can create a 3D model. We will see that we have many ways to do a easy 3D model and why we are doing this is 3D model. And with the, the physical 3D model, with this 3D, uh, uh, physical model, we are able to create and to update in the cloud the different models. And this 3D model is possible not only for one tool, we can use many tools. And the, the thing is that with many tools, it's possible to create this 3D model. Maybe we have, we will see we have drawings, maybe we have nothing, maybe we have a cloud point, a cloud point or maybe a 3D model it could be. And with that, the, the thing is with all the specialists, we will see how, how you can take this 3D model, maybe it's a simplified because it's just for energy simulation, maybe it's for drawings, and you will be able to generate, as I will explain before, uh, afterwards, the air conditioner, the structures, the lighting, the fire design, the plumbing or the energy simulation, of course, the acoustic study, and with this 3D model, will be, you will be able to generate for every specialist all the, the, the tasks that you have to do for a renovation, because remember that a renovation is not only for energy savings, for energy efficiency, is for accessibility, is for comfort, for improve the comfort, and uh, to, to be safety, uh, uh, for fire design as well. And it's important to know that a lot of stakeholders, a lot of species will be uh, for that. And afterwards, they, at the end, they will develop and they, they, they will generate some information through the information or beam information, uh, PDFs, reports, bill of quantities reports, and uh, all the, the needs that you have uh, in accordance with the relation for every country. It depends on the country and every country has different uh, uh, regulation and how, how we can do this process better and how we can generate this process uh, with a, 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 in a good point. This part is, it depends if you are doing, for example, for a fire design or for, a, I don't know, a lighting maybe, but if you are doing for energy simulation, the energy simulation is quite important to take into account that for energy simulation, you need to uh, generate an analytical model. This analytical model in Europe, maybe not in other countries, but in Europe, is very important to take into account the external surfaces, to take into account the internal surfaces, and this 3D model is mandatory to have the ages. The ages will become in thermal breaches or indirect uh, transmission in, in acoustic field. So for energy simulation and for acoustic simulation, the architectural model, the 3D model, is very, very important to take into account these ages. And in order to have an, the, an exact model and from a good quality uh, uh, point of view model as well. In, in, in this case, in, in this project at the part of site that is where uh, I'm working, uh, uh, the uh, the point is that we can do with beam standards that Alvaro we will explain afterwards and and uh, Edil Klima uh, uh, as well. But just a, a, a short introduction for our point of view, we have two point of view. Maybe you have an IFC from a three D modeler, and this is where you maybe Revit, Archicad, Alplam, or Site Architecture. One of them you can generate from architect, uh, an architect model. It is the option one, this is one of them. And the second one is maybe you can use a 3D model, a 3D modeler in order to uh, simplify the simulation uh, uh, model, the analytical model. Well, this is just an, a short interaction that we have. Here. And the thing is, is the one of the parts with the beam, we are talking about, uh, about beam, 
but uh, one of the concepts is open beam workflows. In the renovation part, the open beam is quite important because when you are working with open standards, with standards of files like IFC or another one, is is very important for the future and for the renovation. Why? Because maybe you are working with one tool today, but with another tool in the future. And if you use this standards, this open mean like IFC, like we see here or JSON files, you will be able to uh, to take this information not now, maybe in 10 or in 15 or in 20 years. And you don't you you have no dependency of this uh, third uh, these third parties, this this is tools and uh, this is this proposal this is the reason why in order to have an accuracy and quality tool for renovation from an energy point of view, an acoustic point of view, the open workflow is important. This is just the first option, the, the, the option one that I talk with this 3D model from third parties. We can take this information and in this case, uh, we have uh, some tools. This is a free tool, just an example, uh, open, open beam analytical model. Uh, this tool, you can take the information and uh, you have here some information about it and you can, it's a free tool actually, and you can take all the information from the 3D model and afterwards you will be able to generate all the edges, all the uh, boundaries that you need for your analytical model. This is one option, if you have this 3D model, but uh, in renovation is uh, is normal to have maybe a PDF or a, for the a PDF or DXF on actually the normal thing is to have nothing or maybe the drawings the, and all drawings and with a picture with these drawings you need to generate a minimum uh, or a productive 3D model and in this case for these kind of things uh, you can use IFC Builder. This is another free tool and this is part of uh, that there was in the impact we uh, have demonstrated that this is possible to do it uh, in order to generate the APC, the energy simulation, and uh, one of the parts that I talked before is uh, for uh, the acoustic and more things that we will see. Can, you can see in this slide, for example, the part that you can generate with this tool a 3D model, a simplified 3D model, but you will be able to generate the edges. This HS is one of the parts that for, for a renovation, maybe you don't know exactly what is the thermal breaches, but you can generate this HS and afterwards to simplify your method or, sim or to take into account that and, uh, and what is on the things that is more important. Actually, in some regulations, for example, the French regulations, another one, 30 and 40% of the demand of energy in a building is because of thermal breaches, the thermal breaches. So in a renovation is important as well. And with all these 3D models that I show, you can connect with different tools for energy simulation or for acoustic, for any and any country. The thing is, all these tools can generate an, a standard, maybe an, an IFC. And with this IFC, you will be able to uh, generate the energy model in this case. This is just an example. Uh, to uh, for the EPC and the different parts. Here it's important to take into account that for a renovation we have the energy simulation is one of the things and with energy simulation we will be able to generate some cases, some Im improvements or measures that we will see in other uh, presentation today. And but and, and uh, another point that this is important is the acoustic design, for example. When a renovation point of view, when we are renovating, maybe always we are thinking about uh, the energy savings, and this is important, maybe the most important, but for the co-benefits that we have in for uh, this renovation, the retrofitting is, for example, the acoustic. And for that, it's important to take into account which is the best uh, materials or the, the best manufacturers that we can choose in order to have not only for from a thermal point of view uh, in acoustic term, uh, point of view and the quality of a renovation is in with this is, is part and this is the reason beam is in, 
is, is useful is with the same 3D model, you will be able, we will be able to uh, generate the EPC, the energy simulation, and the acoustic simulation with many tools. This is just an example. Okay, and the reports that uh, in order to have a, a, a better uh, renovation building. And the next step is, I think it's quite important and uh, here in, I'm in Spain and now it's more important because the cases that we suffered in the last days, but uh, the fire design is another part that this is very important in a, a when you are taking into account the renovation because you have you are changing things probably and if you change part of the architecture you have to take into account the fire design or maybe to improve because this fire design was in an old uh, regulation and now the regulations are better and this is a good excuse to to take into account the renovation and with the, this b model you will be able to do it with a fire design a, a stakeholder. In the same way that we are doing the fire design, we have the accessibility design as well. The accessibility design with this 3D model is possible in the renovation to take into account that now the average of the age, the, the age average that we have now is different than maybe 30, 40 years ago when the building was uh, created, was designed. And now uh, uh, you can take into account this in order to, to have better buildings, uh, the accessibility design. Another one is maybe the lighting. With the lighting uh, for this uh, quality of this is for the accuracy that I said before. The same. This, this is the different topics. And this is maybe maybe it's not, not a common a common benefit, but it is a benefit as well. And the lighting to the from a comfort point of view for safety uh, point of view, both of them, uh, you can design it with the same beam model, connect to uh, the lighting tool, whatever it is. Okay, with that, we will be able to create uh, better buildings from an accuracy and quality point of view. And the second one uh, is the second one, the, se the, the next one is the sustainability. With a, with a beam model, we can take all the parameters, all the uh, windows, uh, walls, uh, uh, columns, uh, building services, and everything that we have in the building, and this is important for the impacts, the environment impacts, uh, we can take it, take them, and uh, to generate the uh, CO2, and this is, in this case, is part important for our levels. Uh, uh, certification the, the levels uh, is the European uh, it's for another part maybe it's not today but is the connection that we have we have talked about acoustic any simulation lighting accessibility this is part of levels of course but the sustainability the co2 on the the different impacts that we have with a beam model will be easier to take into account all of them and this is another thing that I I guess it's important for uh, uh, the BIM model and a, a renovation, but the advantage of BIM for that. The, the next one, of if we have a 3D model and we have the different energy acoustic and so on, all the models, uh, other thing that we can do is the, the bill of quantities, the bill of quantities of the, and this is mandatory for a renovation, and we will be able to generate a better bill of quantities uh, uh, reports for the, the project in uh, improvements, the different measures point of view and the, uh, the whole building, because it's not only for the different energy, we can connect the energy simulation with the different uh, uh, budget of every measure, every improvement that we are doing. At, at the end, just to finish my presentation, one thing is for the future, if we are working, if we are working with BIM, and this is connected, maybe connected with the future we have talked or the question that we have for a smart witness indicator, for the different bugs, the different measures that we are doing, the digital logbook. One of the parts is the, the digital twin. When we are talking regarding BIM, if we see or we think that BIM is, 
in the in the renovation stage. I mean, when we are talking uh, about renovation building, uh, the renovation of buildings, uh, we are well, we are talking with design, maybe construction, but not use, not the use stage. But in BIM, uh, what we are talking is all the parts that uh, the concept design or the design of the construction. This is what I I have talked before. But now with this information, we can fit the the model. We can improve the model with a uh, operation and maintenance states. And in this case, this is the digital twin, the combination between BIM and this operation and maintenance information. In this case, just to comment, we are participating in a project, a SATO project, and it's what we are doing. We have the BIM model for Reno. It isn't a renovation point of view. This is the reason why it's for new buildings and for renovation as well. And what we are doing is to take the BIM model, the on-site sensors, and all of them is the combination of them. And we will be able to demonstrate or to uh, analyze and to take better decisions if we combine the uh, the design and construction in information with the on-site and in real uh, with real social the online in information and this is the way to to generate the better decisions for uh, for the future for the different in in, in the for the uh, following renovations and the different parts that we want to do in this renovation of buildings well so this is my part this as conclusions we have the enhanced the collaboration and the coordination with BIM is is important to do it. It's an advantage for a, a for renovation of buildings. The accuracy and quality of the process with 3D models with different specialists, it's possible to do it. Uh, we can enhance the sustainability, generating all the parameters or the impacts that we can do. And one impact, of course, is part from a sustainability point of view and the cost, the different bill of quantities, the different measures, and see com combining the energy simulation plus the, the bill of quantities, we will be able to take the best decision for this project and construction. And with digital twins, we will be able to take into account for the future with all the information that uh, we will be able to have. OK. So uh, this is all for my part. And now is time if you have a question. Thank see. you, Benjamin. We have a, a couple of questions. Uh, one from Diana Romeo. Uh, for the sustainability indicators using BIM model, is necessary objects and constructive systems with sustainable information? And then which database are you using for your projects? Good question. This is a good question, and this is a question for the whole Europe. They have the same problem, maybe in in Sweden or in other countries. But with this information, the database, one of the part is the database. Every country, actually, the new directive uh, for uh, in two three years, it will be mandatory for the whole countries. And, and the database, it's up to the government to take the the rules because it's not the same. The energetic. Point of view is not the same what we have in Spain or in France or in Italy is different point of view and um, and uh, actually in, in what I know in Spain last week we we had a workshop for that and it's not clear what is the different impacts and the different databases that we are going to use and for the materials and the manufacturers what is clear for example in France is actually is now mandatory they have a database and the manufacturers is mandatory for the manufacturers to have the impacts that they have to put in in order to is an EDP or is another name, but uh, is is mandatory and it will be mandatory for the manufacturers to have uh, this information for sure. Okay, thank you. Just a one a last one question because maybe the others can be answered by you while yeah. we have the presentations. Um, uh, Marco Lubeck um, says that it's okay. It's fine, the tools, but seems that they are expensive, yeah? So Depends. Actually, <laughs> most of them that I have used are free. Maybe it's expensive for you because you have to take, but most of them are free. 
It's okay. not very expensive, but it's free. But uh, yes, as maybe some of them. But uh, the, the the moderations, the common environment, all of them, and actually for Spring, for example, the APC certificate that we have, uh, see, are free. But it doesn't matter. <laughs> okay. Okay. We can continue. Let's let's continue. Okay, and we now how we are here. And let's continue with the next speaker. Alice, who are you? Alice Gorino is Hello. the new speaker. Hello, who are you? Fine. Fine so thanks. Alice is going to explain deeply that uh, more, more in depth that I have explained the how to use the three model focusing on the EPC in order to analyze the energy savings. This is what uh, from Edil Klima and uh, Alice. Thank you, Benjamin. Uh, okay. Can you see my screen? I can see your screen, yes. Perfect, okay. So, um, yes, as uh, Benjamin, uh, <clears throat> as, as Benjamin told you, uh, I'm uh, presenting you um, this session that is titled How to use the 3D models and the EPC in order to analyze energy savings. So I'm going, uh, let's say, in detail uh, about the, the procedure. So tool procedures uh, um, uh, to show you how to manage a, a project uh, for generate, let's say, starting from a beam altering tool uh, for the, uh, the creation of the architectural model, um, coupled with an EPC Italian generation tool for producing the energy performance certificate. Um, I'm going to point out some tips and tricks for performing the architectural beam model to better interconnect the beam tool with the EPC tool. Uh, I'm focusing on the 3D model on the building envelope, <clears throat> so I'm not going to talk about the HVAC system. And uh, I'm going also to list uh, uh, the information uh, that are needed for the energy performance uh, evaluation. Uh, so how to complete this beam architectural model for creating uh, the, the energy performance uh, model. Um, and this is the content of the presentation. So I will just show you briefly the workflow of this calculation procedure. And then I'm going through a case study approach showing you the building data from the building architect from the architectural model, how to prepare the architectural beam model, how to import the IFC file into an EPC generation tool. Uh, EPC stands uh, always for Energy Performance Certificate, Certification, okay, Certificate, so, uh, and how to add information on the EPC Generation Tool. This is the workflow. Um, so, uh, as I told you before, I'm going to, uh, let's say, show you an architectural model that is created through ARCHICAD, uh, a, beam soft, a beam authoring tool. Uh, then I'm going to export an IFC and import it uh, into EC700, that is a tool, an annual Klima tool that we, we use, it is uh, validated, uh, from, uh, validated by the um, committee, Italian committee, uh, a, a tool for the energy calculation assessment, also for energy performance certificate purpose. Um, and in the, each phase of this uh, workflow, I will also show you which are the information, the data that you need for the, let's say, starting from the architectural model. So some data uh, uh, are uh, available, of course, from the architectural model, but other information need to be um, added later on. Uh, that are in these data are, let's say, specific data for energy assessment calculation. <clears throat> of course, uh, this, uh, um, this presentation is very related to two specific tools, but uh, I try to be more general in order to also provide you some generalities, okay? <clears throat> And this is the case study. So this is the description of the case study. I mean, uh, it's an office building located uh, in uh, the Italian territory in, uh, in Rome. 
the conditioned floor, net floor area is about 1,400 square meter. As I told you before, for the calculate for the um, creation of the architectural model, we used Archicad from Graphisoft, uh, and for the energy uh, energy uh, energy assessment, we used the uh, EC700 from Edil Klima. So as also Benjamin told you before, of course, the architectural model uh, is uh, very, I mean, contains a vast amount of data, including also um, elements that are not necessary for the energy calculation. So we are not uh, talking about uh, deleting uh, add information from the architectural model in order to export an e import the file into uh, a, let's say, um, an EPC tool. But the fact is that, I mean, uh, the concept is that we, ha we have such architectural model containing a lot of information. The product, I mean, the tool that is receiving the IFC file from this BIM uh, tool should be able to choose which objects are of interest or specific evaluation for creating what uh, Benjamin called you before, the analytical model. If, because I can show you uh, in this slide, uh, let's say, um, uh, some, for example, the, this, uh, in this screen, you can see um, a, a, a transparent component uh, that is, uh, let's say, that contains a lot of information. Uh, it depends on the level of details of the architectural model you are creating, but you can have uh, a very, very detailed uh, detailed component. So, but for, for the energy purpose calculation, only few of uh, these data are um, useful. You can see in the gray boxes, uh, very few information among these varieties of information that are needed for the energy calculation, okay? So not of them are um, interesting. Windows are interesting, of course, all the thermal envelope surfaces uh, that exchange in the, 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 for the calculation of the thermal losses, no? so roofs, doors, floors, rooms, walls. But for example, for the energy calculation, the, detail, the details of the stairs are not uh, useful. So how to prepare the architectural beam model in this case for the energy calculation? So the creation of the opaque and transparent envelope is the first operation to be performed in the architectural model. In this, in this uh, screen, I can show you uh, an Archicad screen. Uh, so we suggest that if possible, the layers of the envelope components should be characterized in the architectural beam model. Of course, it's not always possible because sometimes uh, the, the project is at the early, uh, very early uh, phase. No? So you are you have not such details, inf detailed information. But maybe you know that the wall is composed by the brick part and the thermal insulation part. So in this case, we suggest you to insert such elements in the beam uh, authoring tool. Of course, every modification or, um, let's say, the characterization of the envelope, uh, is, of course, is, um, is also um, uh, done and performed uh, in, the, in the EPC tool after, after um, the, uh, let's say, importing of the architectural model. Uh, but we suggest, if, if possible, to characterize uh, at least the thickness and the number of the layers of the opaque envelope in the early in the uh, architectural architecture phase. How to create the transparent envelope characterization? In Archicad, for example, you need uh, to create at first the, the opaque envelope to create a wall, a hole in the in the opaque envelope, and to uh, draw the uh, transparent uh, in uh, in in uh, in the hole. Okay, this is a procedure that is specific for Archicad. Uh, every authoring tool uh, has uh, its own procedure, but pay attention for the correct procedure of drawing. Uh, um, 
the, the envelope part, because uh, if not, of course, uh, you are going to, um, to use incorrect uh, surfaces, incorrect volumes, and this will, uh, will bring you to, to overestimate or underestimate the thermal losses through the, through the envelope. So it is very important that uh, um, the envelope, both opaque and transparent, are modeled in a correct way. Moreover, it is very important to model separately components um, that for the um, uh, energy assess assessment uh, are separated. I mean, they have uh, very specific thermophysical characteristics. So elements like roller shutter boxes should not be included in the window modeling. Another part that is very important uh, for, um, in to, let's say, for creating a very robust uh, architectural model is uh, to include the IFC space in the model. Uh, in ARCHICAD, these IFC space are uh, named zones, uh, but uh, um, anyway, they are connected to the IFC space uh, that is a very specific part of the IFC file that we are going to use for exporting such information into the EPC tool. It is very important, and so here are some very, um, there are different ways to create these spaces. It is very important to create the spaces because uh, the spaces will uh, maintain some characteristics that pertain to surfaces, to volumes, so it is very, very important uh, to, to create, uh, um, to create uh, this, uh, this kind of uh, entities. And it is also crucial that these spaces do not intersect with each other, nor horizontally or vertically, because uh, overlaps will result in additional and inaccurate quantities of surfaces and volumes. Okay, uh, pay attention also to the vertical section because uh, um, these uh, uh, IFC spaces need to, um, let's say, uh, to um, fill in the entire volume of the building. In the gray one, in the gray, the gray, uh, in this gray part, you see the correct procedure, while in the red part, you see the incorrect procedure. Here, you see this box that is white. It is not associated with a volume, with an IFC space. In this case, if the IFC space uh, does not touch all the enclosing surfaces, this will result in the loss of thermal surface. So it is very important to also to check the vertical section of the building. Another imp very important phase is the creation of the thermal zones because uh, you know that the energy performance assessment is associated to a ter specific thermal zone. For example, in this case, if these rooms were rooms of a, a residential building, for example, uh, each of uh, these blue uh, are rooms, but the thermal zone is not the room, it's the building unit. So uh, it is very important to group the specific ISC spaces into a, a thermal zone. The, in uh, ARCHICAD, this uh, grouping uh, uh, procedure is um, uh, can, you can you can do it uh, in the exporting in the exportation phase of the IFC file, while in Revit you have to do it in another part of the procedure. It is not important where to uh, perform this uh, grouping, but it's very important to perform it. So uh, the um, thermal zone should be created. Of course, uh, once you, of course, you can create the zones uh, in the beam authoring tool. You can always change the zone in the EPC tool, but uh, it is important to create the zone. Now we are in the phase where we are importing this file, the, uh, this IFC file, uh, from the beam authoring tool to EC700 for the energy calculation. So first of all, it is very important to uh, insert some data. Uh, sometimes they, they, they are, um, they, they are 
uh, inserted also in the um, in the beam authoring tool. But uh, for example, the, um, it is very important to underline to 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 to, to insert the building typology. Uh, in Italian, we have a specific specific uh, law um, for the bu building category. So, in um, we need to, or we need to uh, insert the um, uh, the building category in the EPC tool, and also the building the climatic data. In this case, we are located in Italy, in Rome, and then we can import the IFC file. Uh, in this phase, uh, the first uh, dialogue window is uh, the one where you have to associate uh, the material, the materials that you created uh, in the beam authoring tool, to associate uh, uh, every material to the materials uh, that are contained in the, um, uh, in the archive, okay, in the EC700 archive. So in this phase, uh, I mean, in this release of EC700, this is done manually, but in the next release, uh, this will be done semi-automatically. And this is also, uh, this is what I, I told you before regarding the, the thermal zones creation. So in this case, uh, we performed, uh, uh, we have already performed the thermal zone creation, but in this phase, uh, you can, uh, um, you can, uh, you can change, may, you can make uh, some changes in the zone um, in the zone description. For example, some in this case uh, we just created um, only uh, heated uh, zones, while some zones are unheated. So in this in this phase we can change uh, the characteristics of the of the zone from heated to unheated, unheated or um, uh, or into other specificities of uh, the zoning. Of course, while, while we enter the EC700 for the energy calculation, we have a lot. We have other data to be in, to be inserted. So, um, as I told you before, first of all, we need to characterize the term the building envelope. In this uh, slide, you can see that uh, in the exporting phase, uh, we have during the exporting phase, uh, we we just uh, exported all these uh, uh, components, but some of them are not associated with the thermal uh, transmittance of the envelope. So you can see the zero here. It means that uh, this component is not well associated with the uh, material. So uh, what you have to do is to complete the, strat the stratigraphy, inserting all the layers of the components. If you have to change or to add some layers, because in the beam authoring tool you, are, you have not created it, you can of course modify the, strateg the stratigraphy and also adding all the thermal properties, the hydrothermal properties of the, bu the building envelope. Then you need also to um, model the thermal bridges. Uh, so Benjamin to uh, was talking before about thermal bridges. It is a very, very crucial part. You have to create thermal bridges uh, and to associate them to the uh, geometry of the, um, uh, of, the, of, the of, of your building. Um, also regarding the, the transparent envelope, in this case, uh, we have the hole. Okay, we have the geometry of the of the um, of the transparent uh, envelope, but we need to associate to the uh, transparent envelope the frame, the, the characteristic, the thermal characteristic of the frame, and also the solar and the thermal properties of the glass part. <clears throat> The drawing has been already imported, so you just have to check if the zones uh, have been well created, if the heated part is uh, well done, also the unheated part is uh, well modeled, and uh, um, the orientation is correct, uh, but the, of course uh, the, the drawing of the building has been imported. Then you have to associate to each thermal zones which uh, what what is uh, uh, let's let's say what is uh, wh which are the input data that are useful for calculating the heat gain and the thermal losses, for example the user profile, the airflow rate and the set point temperature. I'm just uh, saying you some 
data that are needed for the energy calculation. All these information are present only in the detailed model. So you have to add all this information in this phase. Uh, also, the, shed the shading objects uh, uh, are not automatically imported in this specific case, but uh, in other cases, uh, I mean, in other, uh, with other tools, you are importing also the shading object. And uh, in the next release of VC700, we are, we are also learning how to import this, uh, this shading object. Then you have to model the HVAC system. Uh, so uh, we are not uh, importing any information about the HVAC, so you need to model the heating, ventilation, uh, domestic hot water, cooling if any, and also renewable energy sources if any. After all these passages, you have the uh, you can uh, generate the energy performance certificate. This is the Italian standard of the energy performance certificate and the label you can see here. And this is the last part of this of this uh, this procedure. So just uh, uh, I I hope that all of you get, catched some information, even if you are not user uh, expert user of uh, of uh, Beam tools. But I just wanted to uh, just show you the entire procedure. Uh, and these are the, the major take takeaways uh, from my side. So if, if you use a beam authoring tool, you can, let's say, there, there is a, a very, um, I mean, beam authoring tool plays a significant role in facilitating the creation of an accurate and detailed geometric models of buildings. Of course, you have to, to insert the, the data, uh, very accurate data in the beam authoring tool. <laughs> Otherwise, uh, you are not uh, uh, obtaining a very detailed uh, uh, model. But it's, it's very important to properly create the BIM architectural model, paying attention to all these phases I showed you before. Otherwise, uh, some mistakes may occur in the energy performance assessment. OK, this is... Uh, um, this, uh, I, I, I finished, so if you have, if you like to have more information, this is my email. And uh, so, Benjamin, I can... Yeah. Thank you, Alice. Thank you okay. for the presentation. Thank you. And actually, we have a couple of questions. The first one is about the localization. The, the, the location, are there any verification of the real or correct location based on GPS coordinates of the point of footprint surface for the building or uh, plus cadastre coordinates is uh, yes we have this hmm. yeah in our tool we have uh, this kind of verification because we know that a lot of errors are also coming from this uh, uh, i mean th there are a lot of errors in the energy performance certificate related to the uh, gps coordinates so we have it yes yeah and the second one is that your software uh, uh, here you are like in, taking into account the the uni in ISO uh, 52121 for APC calculation that contributes for of the yeah. BACS and system with mm -hmm. it's BAC. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a long question <laughs> but it's, yeah uh, it takes into account yes but only the um, sim the simplified uh, method so it doesn't take into account uh, let's say the um, the reduction in terms of energy performance if you install if you really install a box or a bems system so it's just a simplified procedure that just uh, uh, provide you with a very very simplified uh, um, uh, let's say amount of uh, decrease of energy yes and the last question is uh, or actually two questions two short question is the EC700 use also for assessing existing buildings? And how much time does it take to use an EPC with this tool? Yes, it's also uh, used for assessing existing building, mm -hmm. of course. Uh, how much time? So of course, how much time? It, I mean, it's a very difficult question. It depends. Because... It depends. This is the... It depends <laughs> on the user, of course. Of course. <laughs> No, I can't. Too. I can't answer. Yeah, yeah. In much it, detail. It, it, yeah, it, it depends on the building, of course. Always yeah. It's the same. Yeah. Okay. So, Alice, thank you very okay. much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And let's uh, pass the next uh, presentation. Wait a second. And yes, is the next presentation is uh, actually we have two speakers now. 
is uh, the first one is the, the percentage generating enhanced EPC with BIM data, and it will be Alvaro Sicilia and Adirane Calvo. They uh, both they are going to 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 explain this and to talk about that. Okay, thank yours. you, thank you, Benjamin. I will start myself and then I will give the, the floor to Adirane. Um, Okay, so after seeing a, seeing a practical example from Alice in the previous presentation, we're going to present the, the, the guidelines, so a document that we have prepared during the Time Pack project to uh, formalize all of these tips, all of these recommendations in how to create a BIM model to assess uh, energy performance certification. So, the BIM model. We, we see the, the, the BIM as a, a center um, document as a center uh, data model that collects all the data about the buildings and uh, helps certifiers to issue EPCs, Energy Performance Certificate, also with the new EPVD, the PVD recast that, that will be um, published in, in the next months. Uh, the BIM model can help us also to uh, generate the building renovation passports and then also could be a central point in the digital building logbook to have all the data about the building, materials, components, everything. Yeah? And we understand that the, the BIM model can take this key role if we use open interoperability standards, uh, basically industry foundation classes, the IFC, that uh, Benjamin in the first, the second presentation uh, talked about. Yeah? So, these guidelines are, uh, the, the title are guidelines for the generation of EP, EPCs from BIM models. And here we focus on two key points. First, that we uh, need to ensure that the BIM model will have all the data required for our issue, the EPC. So this is the first point. And the second point that is, is also very important is to, uh, is to ensure that the BIM model has been uh, modeled, has been constructed in a way that can be later easily imported into the EPC generation tools. Okay, so these uh, guidelines uh, are, uh, has been devised for two main scenarios. One scenario in which you don't have almost anything, just drawings, or you have to visit uh, the building, and you have to create a BIM model from scratch. Yeah, So the, you, you will take some drawings, some pictures, some measurements, and then you will start creating the BIM model. This is the first scenario. The second scenario is when you already have a BIM because it was created by somebody else or by you in the past, and then you want to issue an EPC. So how you are going to validate if this model is properly built or not to issue an EPC. So there are two scenarios. And um, these uh, guidelines uh, goes through this process. We start with the BIM modeling. And in this BIM modeling, we will create an architectural uh, model, an analytical model, and a mechanical uh, model, so three models. Then we will export, we will set up the export process in different tools. Then we will validate in IFC if this uh, resulting um, model is okay or not, and then we will import it this model into the EPC generation tool. Uh, of course, if we find some issues in the IFC validation process in this step, in the third step, then we can go back, we can iterate, we can go back to the B modeling and correct the modeling issues that we, we found and start again the whole process. The guidelines is a comprehensive document, more or less 100 pages, and covers two BIM authoring tools, SIPE and Revit. Also covers two IFC viewers, US BIM viewer, Solibri and BIM Server Dot Center. And then also it covers three energy performance certificate tools, SIPE Term, Edil Clima AC700, and E2 Software. Okay. The guidelines are uh, this document that I said before, comprehensive document, that are, is structured in four main chapters. The first chapter is about uh, BIM data for EPC assessment, in which uh, we propose uh, tips, recommendations, and the minimum required elements that we need for creating the architectural, analytical, and the MEP models. Then the second chapter talks about how to 
exchange the data between the beam authoring tool and the EPC generation tool. And then we have a special chapter with, which we call it uh, in-depth study, which we present some particular cases like curve walls, for example, yeah, that are difficult to model for EPC. And then in the annexes, uh, we have all the data, all the instructions for SIP and for Revit in order to um, model all the different elements that, that we need and, and that, that are detailed in the guidelines. If we move to the first chapter, uh, BIM data for EPC assessment, this is the, the subchapters. We start with frequently, frequently asked questions. We have answered some of them. What is an EPC? What is a BIM? What is IFC, for example? And then we have uh, three main subchapters, architectural model, analytical model, and MEP model. And for these subchapters, we have this structure. We first introduce the model. What does it mean architectural model? What does it mean analytical model and so on. Then we provide general recommendations. And then we describe the minimum required elements that should be modeled in order to issue an APC. And for each model, we provide an, an definition, an explanation, and then uh, specific recommendations to um, set up these minimum required elements for SIP and for uh, uh, Revit. These are uh, three pictures of the so three pages from the guidelines that uh, are structured in this way. For example, this first page, we have the general recommendations. We start with an, a general explanation and then uh, we explain these general recommendations, how can be uh, carried out in Revit and inside these two uh, boxes. And then the second page, we have the minimum required elements that we should introduce in every model, analytical model, architectural model, and so on. We start with a, gen a generic explanation of which are those elements and why they are important. And then some recommendations here in this uh, green uh, box of how they should be modeled in every specific tool. And then how to do it in a specific way with these detailed modeling instructions that are fully covered in the annexes here in the in the right side. Yeah. So this is the structure of the guidelines. And now I Adirane will explain some tips of the guidelines. Hi all. Uh, well, uh, I'm going to explain uh, some of the some examples of what are uh, these guidelines and how to read them and so on, uh, starting by the architectural model, which is the struct, uh, this chapter is structured in three main elements. As Alvaro said, these elements are uh, what is the architectural model, general recommendations regarding location, orientation, division in levels, elements modeling, and so on, and the minimum required elements. And this is thought this way because we aim to um, provide uh, instructions for a wide range of users uh, from the less experienced users in beam modeling that should read all the chapters, uh, one following the other, and for the more experienced users that can go uh, and look for the um, specific information, for example, in the minimum required elements. Regarding the general recommendations of the architectural model, I bring here an example regarding the model location. Uh, so the first time you uh, started to model in Revit, for example, uh, for example, uh, we need to make sure that we start modeling in the correct place. So that's why the guidelines uh, recommend users to uh, navigate through visibility and graphic overrides and select the site um, parameters, making sure the internal origin base project base point and survey point are activated. And when they are activated, then they appear in the um, in the screen. So the general recommendation in this case within the guidelines are to correctly place the survey point uh, in, ref uh, in reference to the base point and to correctly place the base point within a 16 kilometers radius circle for the internal origin of the Revit. Why is that? Because uh, if we don't place these points in the correct place, uh, Revit can experience some functioning problems regarding the calculation of display of the geometry and the software uh, doesn't allow you to, con uh, to continue. 
Regarding the minimum required elements, I bring here uh, the structure of the architectural model within the guidelines, which is divided in building envelope, covering exterior envelope, interior partitions and windows and doors, materials and solar protections. Each of these categories has different uh, information accuracy and has to be uh, modeled in such a way that um, encompass this information accuracy. So I bring uh, another example of this chapter. For example, in, in the case of exterior envelope, one of the minimum required elements is the one if the function of these uh, elements. In this case, when we select a wall and navigate uh, through edit type within Revit, we can uh, see the function parameter here in the type properties, and we uh, should make sure that this wall has the correct function representing the real uh, world. And this is because the EPC software needs to uh, needs this kind of so function to evaluate and simulate the heat transfer parameters, and and it allows the communication between the BIM software and the EPC software. And the opposite got cause that the APC software uh, consider the wrong requirements for the wall in this case and cause some errors like, for example, not including the element in the correct category or uh, evaluating the space as uh, an open space. Uh, here I bring another example of another category, which is the materials category, and the recommendations here are to include uh, the relevant data that we can access to navigate again to selecting by selecting the world, navigate it again through edit type, and then um, editing the structure of this wall uh, and clicking in each of the materials. The material browser is open, and we can then select the thermal parameters of the of each material. Uh, but in this case, this material data is important because the analytical properties of the envelope are automatically calculated and added to the element properties. So this information can be then shared to the IFC model and then exchanged in some cases with the APC software. And if it cannot be exchanged, uh, it is also useful for the APC developers because uh, they have the same information share among all the stakeholders and uh, it can be a, a storage on time and also shared in the future. Uh, each of these uh, modeling has, Alvaro say, has uh, the uh, annex chapter with the detailed modeling, re modeling requirements. Here I bring an example of uh, minimum required elements in modeling for the case of the wall. I talked before, as you can see, uh, the annex uh, chapter is divided in different tables, and these tables are representations of the of the bin software uh, modeling properties. And uh, in this case, what we tried to do was to uh, help the users by um, evaluating step by step how to model in and giving them specific recommendation of each uh, of the parameters regarding the model. So regarding the analytical model, the structure is the same, it's thought for the same user, wide rate, uh, range of users, and the general recommendations is focused uh, in spaces and thermal phones. In this case, the general recommendations are focusing on how to create the spaces and how to create the thermal zones. In the case of the spaces, the guidelines recommend to um, navigate through the Analyze tab and use the correct tools for creating them. Then you can place the spaces uh, as usual. And in the case of zones, the, um, the guidelines evaluate the same thing, how to create the zones uh, properly by navigating to the Analyze tab and creating the zones by grouping the spaces. Spaces and zones, as uh, Alice says uh, in the previous presentations, are important because they define the thermal characteristics of the areas within the building and they allow to create, they are the basis to create uh, the analytical model within each EPC software. 
in conjunction with all the surfaces, edges, and junctions coming from the architectural model. So APC software engines require these analytical models to simulate, and we have to make sure that uh, they are correctly developed. In the case of minimum required elements, um, I bring some example here, such as the space definition. Uh, in the guidelines, it's recommending to make sure that the constraints, dimensions, and identity data of these uh, spaces are correctly representing the reality, such as Alice says. Uh, if you don't um, correctly develop these uh, spaces, maybe the software read uh, these spaces wrong and the calculations um, can have some deviations and error uh, in the PC software. Reg uh, regarding the MEP modeling, the structure of the guidelines is slightly different, only covering what is the MEP model and a small section about what we cannot recommend minimum required elements for the MEP modeling. This uh, case is special because um, two different factors. The first uh, one is that Currently, PC software does not read MEP elements, and in the case, it, the, in the future case, they read it. Different EPC software require different definition of MEP modeling. But what we recommend in the guidelines is to include the MEP modeling because it provides information that can assist the EPC developer, uh, and uh, and in this case, they can avoid to search for the information in technical data sheets and other. Um, methods that uh, are taken time uh, consuming. The next chapter is regarding information exchange for EPC assessment, and it includes BIM data between BIM software and EPC software, IFC exportation and exchange from Revit to IFC and using CP, IFC validation and, I, and IFC importation tools um, in EPC tools. Uh, in concrete, uh, the three of them that, that Alvaro told uh, that we are assessing within the guidelines, which are Cipeterm HE Plus for Spain, and El Clima IC 700 for Italy, and to software for Austria. Some examples of the exportation uh, recommendation of the guidelines are the setup modification to correctly export all the information that we develop through the modeling uh, phase, but also some additional um, instructions on how to proceed when the parameters that we want to, uh, to export are not automatically export, such as the zones, for, for example, that we have to create and export IFC as parameters and we have to select the correct IFC entity. Then the importation phase explains the step by step first steps of the importation of the IFC model within each of the tools. Uh, and the final part of the guidelines, It's uh, I think it's important. It's an in-depth study covering uh, complex design models of what we um, consider complex design models and how to import these complex design models within different uh, EPC tools. Here I bring an example of uh, what is this chapter in the case of each architectural model and how it is imported, if it's possible, or and converted into the EPC software. And some solutions that the technicians have been developed uh, through the time to uh, correctly import the models. So with this chapter, we can ensure that the a well beam and IFC model um, model don't became a uh, missing part model and a wrong model and, uh, when we ex import it within the software, like in the examples of the left. And this is all. Okay, thank you, Adirane. Um, we, these guidelines were developed during the last uh, 12 months and we applied these uh, guidelines in 30 buildings in six different countries, which are pilots of Time Pack project, Austria, Croatia, Cyprus, Italy, Slovenia and Spain. We, we created BIM models from scratch, from drawings, from floor plans and from existing EPCs. We also created 
oh, we also validated BIM models that already were in place. And we use a uh, SIPE um, tool, we use Revit, we use AC700 from Edil Clima. So we, ha we have used all of the tools that are mentioned and are described in the guidelines. The uses of buildings were uh, all of them. Yeah, we had uh, residential buildings and also we have tertiary buildings, offices, kindergartens, or different kinds of um, buildings. And as you can see below, uh, we monitor all the time spent by the modelers and the certifiers in all of these three, uh, 30 buildings. And we calculate the average, of course, it depends on every building and depends on the certifier, the skills that this person has. But uh, for a BIM model created from scratch, it took uh, like 12 hours as an average. And for a BIM model that we already have them and we have to validate it, it, uh, it took eight hours in average. Okay, so once we have applied this, uh, we have applied the guidelines for these different buildings, we, we thought that we had to carry out a reliability assessment. So we need to understand if the uh, BIM model will create um, uh, high quality data to generate the PC or not. So we uh, we make this comparison. We uh, calculate the building surface and the building element surface for walls, windows, and the floor plans for some buildings. And then we compare the deviation between the building surface and the building element surface between EPC and architectural drawings, which are the blue uh, bars. And then we compare it with the deviation between the building surface in the BIM model and in the architectural drawings, which are the green bars. And for the building surface, you can see that the deviations, deviations are very small, are less than 1%, which is okay for the blue bars, but in the case of the bin, are in less, are even lesser, are below 0.2%. Uh, and here, in the case of the windows, we have a, a, a better figure because the deviations with the APCs is around 14%, the, the top, the upper value, but for the BIM models, the deviations are less than 1%. So we have less deviations if we go through this process, so if we generate an EPC from a BIM model. Okay, so the takeaways from this session, uh, we have shown you the guidelines, some tips, some recommendations uh, to how to generate an EPC from BIM model using open interoperability. Uh, through this um, reliability assessment, we can ensure that the APC that we generate from a BIM model we we will be more reliable and we will have high quality data. But here, the interoperability is a key issue because all of this process that moving data from BIM to APC is not so straightforward. There are some issues that have been, has to be been solved. And probably the, the main message that I also linked to the previous comment that we had in the Benjamin presentation. The BIM authoring tools, maybe they are expensive. Creating a BIM requires some time and some effort, so it's not uh, cheap. And if you think, okay, it's not worth to create an EPC from a BIM model, you are right in a short-term vision. But if this vision is enlarged and, and you take the big picture and you say, okay, let's create a BIM today, Let's invest some time, some resources today, because tomorrow I will create a building renovation passport that will create some renovation works during the last, the, the, pro, the next 20 years. Then the beam that you created today can be reused and can be, um, uh, and then the investment will be worth. And this links to the next session that will be given by Suzanne that will explain uh, a bit uh, what is a building renovation passport. Okay. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Alvaro. Thank you, Adirane. Uh, well, we have a question uh, that I'm <coughs> sure you will like it. Is uh, where in the Impact Academy can we get these guidelines? Yeah, I, I forgot to mention <laughs> that uh, these guidelines are internal right now because we are doing a proofreading. And before April, so during March, we will publish them yeah? and we will inform you all. Yeah, so it's coming soon. It's coming soon. It's maybe coming the, soon. Yeah. yeah, but we will be happy to, to communicate. 
Okay, so let's go to the last presentation. Let me share with second the screen. The third presentation is uh, uh, next steps uh, for renovation passport. Okay, can you see my screen? And, and focus on data and tools. And Susan Geisler will be in charge. Uh, Susan Geisler from from Sera uh, will be in charge to to explain and to let us know more information. Uh, about this renovation passport that we are looking for uh, to, to know uh, and and to to see what is the future and now the present actually. Susan, uh, thank yours. you very much, Benjamin. I'm sharing my presentation. Uh, so you should you should see it right now. Yes. So, um, uh, Susan, yes? sorry. we can see the, the the full screen. We actually we are uh, watching maybe the not the the good uh, screen. Maybe you have two screens. Can you? It's not the whole presentation. The full screen. We are going just we see uh, the slide. Yeah. I'm. I'm. What do you see now? We see the the presentation, but not the full screen. We're seeing okay. the PowerPoint. Uh, I'm, I'm going on full screen now, so I see the yeah. full screen. You see the full screen too? Nope, not yet. Not yet. Maybe it takes no. some time. I don't no, know, I, but no. I think I, that I, you, you have screen. to share the full screen yeah. because you are not sharing the full screen yeah. um, monitor. I think. Okay. Uh, I think we. Okay, let's try it again. Let's, let's try it again. Um, I stopped sharing now. Yeah. Oh, I stopped already, right? Yeah. Okay. So, um, let's see. Do you see it now? Yes. Now it's working. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Good. OK, so um, what I uh, would like to uh, present today is a brief overview about um, the renovation passport. Where do we start from? Because the renovation pa passport is actually not a new topic. Then I will go into a little bit of detail uh, about the renovation passport in the upcoming uh, EPPD recast, uh, building on what Eric already uh, presented, and then uh, how do we go from, from there uh, regarding uh, data and tools. So I will present what we uh, the, the findings of our work in time pack and uh, what it means for uh, future uh, uh, processes. So uh, when we look at the EPPD um, and on building renovation, then we see that the, the energy performance of building directive, um, let's say, offers two main instruments uh, to address building renovation. First of all, of course, the energy performance certificate that contains recommendations for improving building energy efficiency and the renovation passport. So what's the difference between the two? Uh, the EPC contains renovations, uh, sorry, contains recommendations uh, for improving uh, building energy efficiency, but uh, these recommendations are often not specific enough and uh, most importantly, the implementation is unclear during the 10-year validity period of an EPC. So we don't know the status of a building, actually. So here, the renovation passport comes in. It contains a renovation roadmap, which is a package, contains packages of renovation measures, which are tailored to a building. And it specifies uh, the necessary measures in the right order with the aim to achieve nearly zero energy building standard in the medium term and zero emission building standard in the long term. So actually we have two complementary uh, instruments. There are also other requirements for the renovation passport. So let's say uh, specifications. Um, what you see, what you can see here in this comparison between the APC and the renovation passport. So most important is, for example, that uh, for the renovation passport, we use specific metered energy consumption. 
Uh, and uh, we uh, have an on-site visit, so it's it's mandatory to visit the building. Um, these, um, let's say, aspects are not taken into account in the energy performance certificate. Um, but when we look at the purpose, <clears throat> we see that uh, the purpose is different. As I said already, uh, we have complementary uh, instruments. What is the purpose of the EPC? The purpose of the EPC is to compare buildings in terms of energy performance, irrespectively of the user behavior. And the EPC is focusing exactly on this to take into account the user behavior because the purpose is to initiate and facilitate the renovation of buildings. And uh, when we look at the economic assessment or the economic viability of renovation measures, the actual use of the building is most important. So there are also uh, other, let's say, um, aspects which are different um, between the two instruments, but I will not go into more detail uh, right now. I would just like to look at practice uh, before we go into more detail uh, on the renovation passport. Why do we need such an instrument? Um, basically, there are two ways to go about the renovation. It's the renovation in one go. That's the most, let's say, <laughs> best or would be the ideal way how to do it. Uh, in terms of uh, economic uh, aspects, but also in terms of, uh, let's say, um, uh, user from the user perspective and uh, regarding the, the, the energy performance that can be achieved. But often, this is just not possible. And therefore, um, the state, and in, the, in these cases, the stage renovation comes in, which means we uh, design packages of renovation measures which can be implemented over time, but with the, with the aim or with the objective um, to turn the building into a nearly zero energy building and later into a zero emission building at the latest uh, by 2050. Um, in large buildings, these renovation passports are, or uh, renovation roadmaps um, are um, synchronized with the maintenance and repair plan. Um, so that would be the ideal situation. Uh, as I said already, the building renovation passport uh, is not uh, new at all. Um, so when we look at the EU level, uh, it was introduced as building renovation passport uh, by amending directive uh, from uh, 2018. And it was detailed by a BPIE technical study. And when you look at that uh, methodological approach, which is shown on this slide, you see that uh, we have basically three important elements. Um, we uh, collect data. Um, or use existing data repositories, for example, like uh, the EPC database. Uh, we process data in a form that we can use them for uh, drawing up uh, a renovation roadmap, which consists of these uh, packages of renovation measures. And we already have that uh, building logbook, um, which um, is um, an approach uh, to collect building, um, building data at the same place update them and make them accessible. At the national level, um, we have elements of the building renovation passports um, in many countries uh, since many years as part of subsidy schemes. Uh, but there are also related processes where we find the elements of the renovation passport, which are energy audits and also energy advisory schemes. So uh, we already have a lot of information or also a lot of, um, let's say, we have approaches in the member states. Um, and the question is now, how do we uh, go from here um, with a view uh, to the EPPD recast, uh, which we expect in the next month? So what are the new elements now? Um, there are basically uh, three important uh, aspects. First of all, the process how to uh, draw up a renovation passport is now specified. Um, 
there is the requirement for digital tools that link the APC database and the building logbook. And uh, we are confronted with, with many more indicators which are uh, necessary to be covered and therefore also um, a vast, let's say, um, uh, amount of input data we have to uh, cope with. So when we look at um, this overview of the, of the let's say, um, specification of the renovation passport, um, I would just like to um, focus on uh, one uh, aspect, namely the option to allow the renovation passport to be drawn up and issued jointly with the EPC. In this case, the renovation passport shall substitute the EPC recommendations. So this is uh, this is um, this part um, makes it very clear how the EPC is um, linked with the renovation passport and how these uh, two in instruments uh, complement uh, each other. Um, we have uh, an annex. Uh, providing spec more specifications for the renovation passport. Um, this annex is quite, uh, let's say, comprehensive. Uh, it provides mandatory and optional requirements, uh, whereby I will only um, go into a little bit of, not detail, but some aspects of the mandatory part of that annex. Um, and I would uh, like uh, to highlight here that um, we, um, I would like to highlight two aspects. The first aspect is uh, that um, we need information about the renewable energy share and we need information about um, the, let's say, the avail availability of uh, district heating and cooling networks. And this is information uh, that uh, we usually get from municipal information systems. So it's not, um, yeah, we need spatial information to answer that uh, questions. So the renewable energy uh, on the one uh, part and the second uh, aspect I would like to highlight is that we are now confronted with many more indicators, for example, uh, product circularity, whole life cycle greenhouse gas emission, wider benefits, indoor, envir indoor environmental quality, and uh, improved adaptive capacity of the building to climate change. Um, so these are, these are important aspects that um, bring us uh, to the, let's say to the question, how can we manage these uh, data collection exercises uh, most efficiently, or is it possible to avoid uh, repetitive data collection exercises. So actually, we we did uh, case studies uh, in TimePack and uh, to create renovation passports based on the tools which are existing and based on the data repositories which are existing in in the, in our partner countries. And we came up with a let's say a workflow or a, a suggestion for a rough workflow. Uh, we start from existing uh, data, uh, do an on-site visit to complement the data and update them. We elaborate a renovation roadmap and we prove, um, we prove uh, that we can achieve uh, the targets uh, by means of an EPC calculation. The first package of measures would then be secured for financing, planning and execution work would take place a new EPC will be issued and we would then update the renovation roadmap accordingly and, and um, yeah, we would update the renovation roadmap accordingly. So um, regarding tools, um, we identified two approaches, uh, which I will summarize um, on one of the next slides. First, I would just like to show how um, our case studies look like. So this is the the, the case of um, an, an apartment building located in the, in, the, in the Austrian province of Lower Austria, where we identified um, the, 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 the renovation measures um, 
in uh, taking into account the the maintenance maintenance and repair cycles. So so the sequence of measures uh, was is based on on the on the the renovation plan for the building that already exists and the 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 energy performance analysis. So uh, here's the summary um, I, I promised already uh, regarding the link between the EPC and the renovation passport. Actually, uh, we identified two ways uh, to establish uh, that link, depending on the situation in the countries. Uh, first, we have the situation that the EPC software uh, includes already many features, such as energy modeling that is already linked to material databases and uh, that already contains a module for developing the renovation roadmap. So such tools would need to be further developed to meet all the other requirements of the new renovation passport according to amending directive, uh, sorry, to, to, uh, according to the, the expected recast of the EPPD. And then uh, we have the situation that the EPC software is a simple tool um, or would remain a simple tool uh, for proving compliance with legal requirements, but energy modeling and developing uh, of the energy of, of the renovation roadmap and the indicators um, would be done uh, with other tools. Regarding data, I said already that um, we uh, or We've already heard a lot of, about uh, the building logbook, which is a collection of data in the same place. But uh, as I said already, we um, also need uh, spatial information with regard to renewable energy utilization and the availability of district and cooling uh, district heating and cooling networks. So uh, this information about uh, the renewable energy potential is essential when we want to go uh, for decarbonization uh, of the building stock. Uh, so this is maybe something that um, can be also addressed in future work, uh, how, to, how to establish also that link uh, between uh, the building logbook and uh, the municipal information system. Uh, regarding link between renovation passport and building logbook, uh, we have um, basically identified uh, two approaches. The first is um, that the software tool creates a calculation result and that calculation result is uploaded to a database. So in our case, the calculation result is now the renovation passport. Um, so this is, this is an option uh, that is um, already uh, available in some countries. For example, in Austria, we have uh, the EPC database environment, which means uh, we can we have a kind of account for each building where the EPC is uploaded, but also other information like advisory reports or renovation passports or any other information the building owner would like to store there and make it accessible to other uh, users, third parties. And uh, this option can also be found um, uh, when we, uh, for big companies, for example, they have their, their own databases and their own platforms and provide information to consultants for certain certifications, SRI, for example, or levels or any other green building certification. Uh, the second approach is that a BIM offering software creates the calculation results via connected software tools, and then the assessment results are exported for further use. So that's the case for that, let's say, building logbook approach uh, that is uh, covered by uh, a BIM offering software, uh, what we heard already today, uh, Benjamin presented uh, that approach, and this is also the link to what Alvaro presented. Uh, both approaches, um, let's say, have the challenges, uh, but uh, when we look into the future, and in conclusion, um, what I said uh, regarding the broad range of indicators we have to cover and 
the, the input data needed for this exercise, I think it's quite clear that the BIM-based approach uh, can offer many advantages. Um, among others, it is also possible to track uh, the implementation of re refurbishments, to track the evolution of a building. And uh, this is another uh, interesting topic, which I will not uh, address today. Uh, this is um, a topic I would like to address in the next webinar on the 12th of March. So actually, we will continue with um, some input on the renovation passport. For, for today, I close and um, hand over to Benjamin. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Actually, you have done a spoiler, I have to say, for the presentation of the 12th, but good, it's good. Yeah, uh, let me share again the screen. One second. Uh, do we have any questions for Suzanne? I think it's, it's clear, or we will have all the information with the because the slides and I may. My point of view is very full of information and very interesting information actually, and and you will be able to to read it afterwards. Uh, well, if there is no question, I'm going to share my last for the presentation. This is the last part of because we have not much time. Wait a second. OK, so this is. The last, just to finish uh, as a conclusions that we can do, the conclusions of this webinar is in, in two hours, we we have shown how is the new directive for a, an, a public uh, a institute of public, the, the Ministry of Slovenia, and they have taken our point of view. Afterwards, we have seen three point of view for three pictures of the BIM technology, how we can help us for uh, generating this renovation of buildings from a, a different benefits and co-benefits from lighting or for not only for energy, for acoustic or for fire, the different parts of with the beam server center that I saw and the different tools we and the, the and the third part is with a specific workflow with, uh, with that uh, Alice from Medil Clima they have shown. And uh, for finally the guidelines that we are looking for, uh, we are looking forward to to sharing with you because it's it's, it's a, a a good task and it will be very very useful for you for you in the future. And with uh, uh, Alvaro and Adeline, and at the end the 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 digital logbook and what is the passport, the digital passport, or this now. All the information that we are creating, how we will be able to uh, to share and to get this information for the future. And if this is one of the things that I wanted to explain, and uh, the second one is, don't forget that this is what I said because of the <laughs> the, the spoiler, Susan. This is uh, the next webinar will be uh, on 12th of March. It's analysis and visualization of APC data and development of innovative, innovative energy services. And it will be very, very interesting. And uh, we will be happy to uh, to see you there in, in one week. And uh, please uh, share your impressions with us of this webinar in the online questions that you have here in this form. And at the end, thank you all of you for, uh, for your support and thank you of course, the, the speakers for today.